pediatrician, you will see that part of my work actually will deal with old people and how skeletal muscle and aging uh, gives you trouble. But I think we are learning a lot of things from old people back to our kids. So if you look at this slide, this is a group of patients from my clinic. This is a girl who has a congenital muscular dystrophy. That's a boy who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's a, uh, another girl who has a milder form of myopathy. And that's actually a boy who can't really move much and has very little muscle mass, but has a chromosomal defect. So there are many, many different inherited ways of how your muscle can be affected and how your muscle can get weak and uh, muscle mass can be decreased. And then there are a number of acquired forms of how you lose muscle mass. One is simply when you wear a cast, and uh, the people in the audience who did that uh, because of trauma before, you know that after getting this cast off, your leg or your arm is weak for weeks and weeks and weeks. When you go up into space, you come down, and one of the biggest problems you have is that your muscles are not working as much as they should be, and it takes months to recover from that. And these are just patients with either uh, cancer cachexia or trauma uh, who, who, had uh, who had severe immobility for several months. And then, of course, one of the leading problems uh, of age-related muscle loss is called sarcopenia, which, which is about 20, makes up about $26 billion health cost per year just because of decreased loss of muscle function and mass during age. All right, so when you look at muscle mass and you think about how is it maintained, you have to look at like a triangle uh, and a balance out of making sure that you don't break down too much protein, making sure that you uh, make enough protein, and then making sure that your muscle can regenerate well. And we're going to talk about all these three aspects of this during the talk. So the first story I'm going to tell you is coming from an area uh, where we started to do research about two and a half years ago, and that is exploring the world of hibernation. So why am I doing this? Well, let's start. You see, it's still dark. I have to apologize that these pictures are actually not as dark as they appear here. But that's a bear. I hope you can see that. And as you can imagine, it's neither practical nor cost effective to do research with a bear. Uh, and I can tell you that from my perspective, it's actually not interesting. Because if some of you know a little bit about hibernation, these animals don't drop their temperature. They maintain their temperature through the entire winter time. And although they don't move much and they don't eat, which both are things which significantly decrease your muscle mass, they're shivering to maintain body temperature. And that electrical activity is probably enough to maintain muscle mass. So this is an animal which is not interesting to me. Um, <laughs> that is an animal which potentially would be interesting to me. It was in, the, in my backyard when I wrote this grant, believe it or not. Seriously, I'm not lying. Uh, that's a woodchuck. And there's a company in North Dakota who offers researchers to go there and do research with woodchucks. Not really because of muscle interest, but they have some protection against hepatitis viruses. So it's not my fault that I haven't seen this woodchuck again. I want to make that clear. The animals we're using are these animals, which are the 13 line ground squirrels. And these are different than the squirrels from the East Coast. I don't know where you are come from here. These are squirrels that don't run around here. Uh, we're actually getting them from a wonderful woman uh, in Wisconsin who has a breeding colony. And if you look at these squirrels, then I'll tell you what happens throughout the year. Um, around September, I go to Trader Joe's and buy $150 worth of non-salted nuts. And again, I'm not lying. The first year I did this, the person at the cashier asked me, why do you buy so many nuts? I say, you really want to know? So we got to a discussion about hibernation and Trader Joe's. Anyway, so you, you buy these nuts, and then these animals take this round, ball-like form on. And then they drop their temperature and take on what we call a fetal position, or like torpid position. And at that point, in a laboratory setting, you put them in a refrigerator. Regular laboratory refrigerator. And the only thing they do is every two to three weeks, they wake up briefly run around for about two hours. They don't really run, but they walk around. And they urinate. It's the only thing they do. They don't eat, they don't drink for the entire six months, but they urinate. And they keep urinating until the very end. So we don't. nobody knows what that means, and it's not my focus of interest, but there's something very biologically important about that, I'm sure. They have to get rid of, rid of some kind of waste, I'm sure. 
And then in the spring they wake up, and I'll show you a video of how that looks like. That's a hibernating squirrel. And you can see it looks pretty much like dead. <laughs> they breathe only about once or twice per minute, and their heart rate is only about once or twice per minute. So you really have to sit there for 30 seconds at least to catch your breath. And this here is a squirrel that just woke up from hibernation. Just keep looking at this for 10 seconds. So, this is a squirrel that didn't eat and drink for six months and didn't move much and then wakes up. It takes about 15 minutes for them to wake up. They run, they're, they're moving like drunk for a little bit and then they are awake and then they jump like this. So if you think about what you would do, even if you would feed you, or myself, uh, if you don't move for six months, your muscles will be gone no matter how old you are. So, that's the reason why we're doing this research. And I'm going to walk you through some very interesting findings, uh, and we can discuss them if you want to at a later point. First of all, if you look at the muscles, and again, I apologize for this slightly darker picture, the muscles under the microscope look identical, which was the first surprise to me as somebody who has been interested in muscle, because I was at least expecting something, some depositions or something. And it literally looks the same way, and if you count muscle fibers uh, by measuring the size of these circles here, you see that there's really not much difference. If at all, the hibernating ones, which are the blue ones, are maybe slightly larger, but it's not significant. So don't think that hibernation makes you big muscles. It just protects your muscles from not uh, leaving. So the question is, is this a matter of protein synthesis breakdown, or is it a matter of muscle regeneration? Uh, due to the interest of time, I'm not going to show you the data that muscle regeneration does not play a role. So we did a lot of experiments, and I can tell you there's something interesting about the fact that they don't make scar tissue, but they don't repair damaged tissue during hibernation either. Um, so what I will be talking about is the protein synthesis and protein breakdown pathways. And now it's getting going to get a bit complicated, I have to admit, but I will try to keep it as simple as possible. There's one major pathway, literally uh, around for over 10 years, which is this AKT-driven pathway. So AKT is a molecule which is a lot and a lot of different things in your body, uh, some bad things, including cancer, but it also is activated via IGF-1 up here, which is the insulin growth factor, makes sure that you don't break down enough proteins by phosphorylating this FOXO3A protein, and then via the mTOR pathway, which is another very significant pathway, leads to muscle hypertrophy by synthesizing, synthesizing protein. Okay, so we're going to look at these members of this pathway, one after another, and see what they do during hibernation. And the first thing you can see, and that is not really not, you have to believe me now that there's more here during hibernation. During hibernation, you have an increase of the IGF-1. So what is upstream here, this, there's more IGF-1 in the muscle uh, of the hibernating squirrels. Now with that in mind, you would expect that there will be more AKT and there will be more phosphorylation of this FOXO3A and more of the mTOR pathway. So here's what I'm going to show you what these squirrels do, which is pretty interesting. First, you see more of this FOXO3A, like I told you here. If you look at the bar, blue versus red, there's more of this here. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that you would expect that this AKT molecule, <coughs> which I showed you before, would go up too, right? It doesn't actually goes down. And that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It didn't make any sense at the time when we looked at this. And if you now look at um, other pathways, this is the mTOR pathway here. Just look at these colors, uh, blue versus red. There's significantly more of this mTOR. And if you look at cell survival pathways, there's significantly more cell survival pathway during hibernation. But all these pathways, so far, these for the last 15 years have been thought to be activated by AKT, and clearly it's not because it's actually going down. 